I decided to call my talk, well, the original sort of motivation from Brian, uh, I thought I'd call it my brilliant career. <laughs> but I found out that someone had already taken that title, so um, I can't do that. So I, I thought I'd use this title. You'll see why in a minute. Um, but uh, I also thought I'd put my brief up there from Brian um, as to um, what I was supposed to do. And the reason I put it up there was because the first part of the talk, I'm going to credentialise myself. Right? And um, you all know that the one thing Australians hate is people <laughs> credentialising themselves. Right? Who is this blowhard, you know? I mean, um, and so it's a very American thing to do, to credentialise yourself. And it's why Australians and Americans initially have a lot of trouble with one another because of that. Um, the American is not thinking that he's boasting. He's thinking that he is, he is trying to establish in some way um, uh, the reason why you might like to talk to him, right? Um, he's not doing it in a boastful manner. Um, but we interpret it that way. So I'm about to be very American. The um, text for my sermon this morning comes from um, the, great, <coughs> the great Chinese poet Li Po. Um, I, was, I have always been very tickled by this, um, by this quotation. It seems to me that it does encapsulate what all good academics should aspire to. Uh, I have it on the front page of my PhD thesis, 1975. So in those days, I don't know whether it's still the custom, but in, in science, we always used to put some sort of literary quotation on the front of our theses just to show people that we actually were creatures of both worlds. You know, we actually um, understood literature, even though we hardly ever read a book and things like that. <laughs> Um, so you always had to have one of these quotes, and I was tickled pink to find this one. But in fact, I learned that um, I have stronger connections with this guy than just this general um, philosophy of life. <laughs> Lee is his family name, okay? Lee is my first name. Po is, apologies for the Chinese who can read this, um, this is his first name, his given name. And it's, it's, um, it's Bai, I think that's the way you say it. So it's, his name is really Li Bai, but of course, in the West, we always take Chinese names and screw them around. So um, it's very, he's variously known as Bo or Po, and in fact, Li Po is, the, is the, uh, where I first came to know him. You might say, why am I waffling on like this? Well, a Chinese guy came into my office one day and he was admiring my calligraphy that I had there, and then he saw this sign that I have uh, crocheted above my desk. And he said, that's really interesting. He said, do you know that that guy's name is, in Chinese, it's, it's uh, Li Bai, and Bai means white. So I knew there was something attractive about this guy for a long time. <laughs> anyway. Let me credentialise myself. That's my academic um, career. I did my um, Bachelor of Science degree at the University of Queensland in 1968. Um, they were the good old days when uh, it was easy to get into medicine and it was hard to get into, um, into science. Uh, anyway, when I did my degree, I, I really worked hard. I, I did basically about three times as much coursework as um, you needed to do to get a degree and I was obsessed by the fact I didn't know anything uh, and I wanted to know everything. Well I couldn't fit everything in so I, I tried to know as much as I could about uh, chemistry, physics and mathematics. I missed out on all of biology um, I didn't get all of mathematics either. I didn't get any statistics. I didn't get much in the way of pure mathematics. But I did try to learn about a lot of areas. Well, after my degree, I, 
I did an honours degree in physical chemistry. I was, um, I had a scholarship with the state government. I was bonded uh, to the Queensland Health Department. It was a bit like slavery, but you did get out of it after a while. Um, I, in fact, escaped. Uh, but uh, I was bonded to the Queensland Health Department. I worked for the government analysts, and we did all sorts of amazing analysis. In my first year, I measured the calorific content of coal forever, it seemed. <laughs> In my second year, I did, um, I, I measured uh, the, uh, whether or not various foods complied with the Queensland Health Act. And in my third year, I did forensic analysis. We looked at, uh, um, you know, how people died, basically. Um, it was very interesting, but it was not what I wanted to do. Um, and so I went back to university, broke my bond, went back to university and did an honours degree in theoretical physics. Right? At that stage, those of you who know anything about theoretical physics, that was a hot time in physics. The standard model of nuclear physics was just starting to be understood. Um, everyone wanted to do that. And in fact, I dabbled with the idea that I might be a, a nuclear physicist too. Um, in the end, I, uh, I didn't do that. And uh, I went to uh, the Australian National University and did a PhD in applied mathematics. And that was where I developed my interest in um, colloid and surface science. Now, what do you learn from a career like that well, from the um, age of those, or those dates up there, you realise that the speaker was, is now moderately well bottle-aged. Huh? Um, I've only got a couple of years before I retire and I'm looking forward to it. You can tell that perhaps I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, huh? that there's some uncertainty about career direction. I didn't know whether I wanted to be a chemist or a physicist. But in fact, I always knew I wanted to be a research scientist, and I always knew that if you wanted to do that, you had to do it at a university, or you could do research in a company, but you did what someone else told you, and I never wanted to do what anyone told me. So, um, uh, but the one thing that I did know, and I, I do remember, and I still have that feeling, is that I wasn't prepared to do a PhD. You're supposed to come out of your honours year, raring to go and do your PhD. And, I, and, and the reason I went back and did another honours degree was that I felt I don't know enough to start a PhD. And I still feel that. Having uh, got my PhD, I then did, over a fairly long period of time, now you can see what my academic career is, I did postdocs uh, at the University of Bristol in, in uh, physical chemistry. That was the place where colloid science was done in England at that stage. Um, <clears throat> I then came back to Melbourne um, to do a postdoc in uh, physical chemistry. I went back to the ANU as a research fellow. Then I came back to Melbourne as a lecturer in physical chemistry. In um, early 90, 1984, uh, I got promoted to senior lecturer and immediately was given the chair in um, mathematics. Now you might think that's a bit funny, but my work was always theoretical. Um, and um, so it wasn't that big of a hop to go from chemistry to, um, to mathematics. There were some mathematicians who didn't like it. In fact, I was instrumental in causing the resignation of two of them. Um, but they couldn't stand the idea that a chemist could come in and become the professor uh, of, of mathematics. But nevertheless, um, and that was my first inkling that there was something rather precious about mathematicians uh, uh, that I've never shared, and in fact I quite despise. Um, but <clears throat> nevertheless, so I got the chair and then I proceeded to spend, uh, what is it, 14 years uh, make an ass of myself. Uh, during that time, I uh, formed a triumvirate with um, Tom Healy in physical chemistry and Dave Boger in chemical engineering to form one of the first um, ARC special research centres. Um, and that's, I think it's finished now, but it had some reincarnations down the traps until very recently. Um, that, was one, that was 
I think the first round of ARC special research centres. Uh, in 98, uh, I uh, left Australia to go to America. I went to become professor of chemical engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. They had a very good uh, chemical engineering school and they had a group there that was doing the sort of work I was interested in. So um, it wasn't too much trouble to get a, a, um, a professorship there. Um, and I was perfectly happy there until 2008. Um, during that time I was the director of this uh, Centre for Complex Fluids Engineering. Um, in 2008 I came back to Australia to a chair in mathematics at uh, University of South Australia. Um, now you ask yourself why? Well there were two reasons. One there was a divorce, uh, <coughs> uh, but two, and never underestimate this, the Howard government had the best superannuation scheme in the world, and I mean the world. Right? You could put a hundred thousand a year at my age off the top of your salary, right? Tax well, fifteen percent, some trivial amount compared to the forty-eight you were paying, um, could go straight into your super scheme. So I saw the way of basically bringing my much impoverished superannuation. Uh, from the States, bringing it back to something that I could retire on, um, and that's why I came back. Right? I came back for the money. <laughs> I've been a good researcher. Right? I say that with some personal pride. Not arrogance, but personal pride. But during that time, I, I always believed that a professor had a responsibility to his university. You, you have a responsibility to carry some of the administrative weight. You don't have to carry it all. You don't have to do it all the time, but you do have a responsibility to deliver for the university. So I did that. I've been the head of my department. Um, I was deputy dean of uh, my faculty. Um, and then I became the inaugural dean of graduate studies at Melbourne University. They were in the days when there was only one Dean of Graduate Studies in Australia, and that was me. Um, and that was a marvellous job. I got to build buildings, um, totally design the system uh, to make graduate study at Melbourne University um, a, an enjoyable and enriched experience. I haven't had any administrative jobs until just recently. I'm now the director of, the, of this doctoral training centre, and at the end of the talk I'll explain a little bit about what that is. What can you learn about, about that? First of all, that I'm not a career administrator. I've done my share, but you can see I haven't done it for very long in any, in any place. And I won't go into why I haven't done it for very long. I won't be doing this job for very long. I'm retiring in 2013, and that's the end of it. One thing that I hope would come across from that is that I've always had an ongoing interest um, in training of higher degree students. I haven't had so much interest in the training of undergraduates. It seems to me they train themselves. <coughs> but, um, and if they're interested, they survive that. Um, what I'm interested in is training the ones that are going to go on and do, uh, and do research. In a, in a sense, you're propagating yourself by, by doing this. They're your children, if you like. Um, and I've always felt that one should look after your academic children. Okay, so what is my research? Well, I'm not going to show, um, I'm not going to talk anything about it. I've listed a whole lot of topics up there, but basically I'm a theorist um, and I work in this area of colloid and interface science. People know what colloids are from the Greek word kola, meaning glue. Um, basically glue is fine particles of uh, protein-like material that float around in water. Colloids are finely divided matter and the properties of finely divided matter in suspension is, um, is what I look at. And there are some of the areas that I've, I've worked on and still work on. What can you learn from any of that? Well, um, this, this is sort of my view of, of how you do research. It's idiosyncratic but it's the way that I work. I don't study areas, right? I don't steep myself in some particular area. I flit around the place like a butterfly. Newton said he, 
he was like a child on the beach picking up one bright pebble after another. I, I have the same way of doing science. I like to do a problem, forget about it, and go on and do another problem. Right? I don't like to publish paper one in an area and then paper two and then paper three and then paper four. I like to flit around. That's not everyone's um, cup of tea, but what I find about doing problems from all over the ship is that you very rapidly um, become a master of the universe, right? or at least a master of a piece of it. You know a lot about a lot. Right? And when you know a lot about a lot, when someone comes to you with a new problem, you can say, that looks a lot like one I've already done. Uh, and so you're, you've immediately got to jump on, on, on uh, solving that problem. Um, so I find this business about um, uh, picking the eyes out of things, uh, publishing and then moving on to pick the eyes out of something else, I found that a very useful way to do science. One of the things I've not mentioned up here, but I will say now, is if you look at my publication record, almost all my papers are published with someone else, at least one other person. Okay? There is, the lone scholar is dead. Right? You don't get funding anymore. Um, and it's not a very creative way to go. Right? Um, bouncing your ideas off other people and doing research with them and writing on the board and shouting at each other, um, that's fun. And um, that's what I get out of doing research, that sort of interaction um, with other bright minds. And, uh, and it actually makes for more productivity, that, that working uh, with others rather than sitting in your room by yourself doing, doing uh, what you think is important um, for yourself. There's a theme through all of this is that all the problems that I've done are basically motivated by important industrial processes. That is, you don't um, come up with some idea out of the blue. Um, you are motivated to look at a certain problem by an industrial problem that has come to your attention. That, um, uh, and, and so um, I've worked with a lot of companies over the, over the years uh, in a consulting capacity. Um, Maytech and Malvin are scientific instrument companies that um, were interested in what I knew about electrokinetics. Uh, um, uh, Lubrizol as well. Amira is the minerals industry research body, um, so flotation and so on. Department of Energy and NASA in the States. ICI UK was interesting. We were looking at the cracking of, um, of thin films. Um, <coughs> Seagate Technology was one I worked on in Pittsburgh um, on um, uh, the lubricant that you put on, on the top of a um, hard disk to, to prevent the head when it crashes into it from uh, damaging the material that's written on it. Um, they're all sorts of, of uh, the problems that, um, that I've um, had a look at. So, so not like pure mathematics where you wake up in the bath and yell out Eureka. You know, it doesn't happen like that. Uh, it's, it, these things are motivated by real world problems. Right? And the other thing that I think is really important is that I only ever look at what interests me. I don't do problems because they're there. Um, so people come with me, to me with problems all the time, and I say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's very interesting. Have you thought of this? And they go away, and I never do anything on that problem, right? Because it doesn't interest me very much. Right? Um, I can see it interests them, but it doesn't interest me. So I don't feel obliged to do a problem because someone presents me with it. Um, I do the ones that I like or I think are going to teach me something. Um, I don't do problems that other people tell me are important. You know, the history of science is full of these, uh, these fads that happen. Chaos theory was a fad in mathematics. You know, it accomplished nothing and no one cares about chaos theory anymore. Um, in, in my field, the Russians discovered polywater, right? This anomalous form of water turned out to be an experimental um, hoax, but only after 10,000 papers appeared uh, on, on it. Um, cold fusion is another classic, right? Um, 
thousands of people rush into the field because they think how important it is. If you're lazy like I am, right, and you like to think about things, you can't compete with these 10,000 ravening um, hordes, right? You just can't compete with them. Um, so don't do those problems. Don't do hot topic problems. Do ones that interest you. Do ones that you ultimately know are important. Um, and do them at your pace. Right? If you get on bandwagons, you'll fall off the back. Right? Because for every one of you, there's 20 Americans with better resources, right? um, all trying to do the same thing. You can't compete. Okay, more credentialization. How do, you, how do you assess your research career? Well, there are accepted uh, KPIs. Publications is the classic one, okay? Um, I haven't written any books, because um, I, I might write one when I retire, but I don't have time to write books. Um, I've only published 149 papers. They've always been in the best journals, um, but it's only 149. That's not a, a huge amount. There are people with 400. The famous scientist in my area, Boris Deryagin, um, he has something like 2,000 publications. Right? Now it's obvious total crap. He can't have <laughs> he can't have had anything to do with more than 100 of them, I reckon. <laughs> but he was the director of an institute in Russia, and if the director's name didn't go on it, it didn't go out. You know. <laughs> There's something in here for everyone. Um, okay, so this is your productivity here. Right? This is your impact. Okay? There's not much good publishing papers unless someone reads them and cites them. Right? Um, so I don't know what the equivalent thing is in your discipline, but it must be something like that. You heard Ian say that, it, that you know you've succeeded when people tell you back what you've done, right? That he, he's basically saying, I think, um, you get cited, right? Um, and there are ways of measuring citation. <coughs> There's a buzz thing around these days called the H index, Hirsch. Hirsch Index. Um, it's an interesting statistic. I've thought a lot about it, and there's been a lot of studies about what it means, the Hirsch Index. Do people know what it is? It's basically the number of your papers that have sites bigger than that number. It sounds like a stupid thing, doesn't it? But it actually, it, it's quite meaningful. So I have 44 papers that have been cited 44 or more times. Okay, that's, that's what that means. Um, and, like all life, the bigger the better, you know? Um, you're supposed to have the biggest H index you can get. And, you know, that's what you do at the staff club. You sit around saying, my H index is... <laughs> what does a H index mean? It doesn't mean anything by itself. Right? Um, you have to judge it with your peers. Right? That is a low H index compared to a medical researcher, okay? It's slightly low compared to a chemistry researcher. A chemistry researcher who is a really gung-ho guy would get, if you wanted to be elected to the academy, for instance, you should have something like 55, 60 uh, in, that, in that area. Um, an applied mathematician, on average, has a Hirsch index of about 15 to 20, okay? So why am I up here? What a great applied mathematician. How come I haven't got all the awards under the sun? Because mathematicians don't view what I do as mathematics. Um, it's somewhere between physics, uh, between physical chemistry and mathematics, and so it falls between two stools. So I don't get uh, inducted into the academy, uh, but I sit outside and sneer at them. Huh? <laughs> The other way that you um, measure performance as a researcher is that you propagate yourself, okay? You, you, um, you graduate um, your, your students that become better than you, 
if they're not better than you, you haven't trained them properly. Um, they should be more energetic. They've got everything you know now, right? And, and they've got all the time in the world to find out something else. The other thing uh, is, of course, the um, awards, and I've got a few, not a lot, but a few. Um, and, uh, um, you know, they're useful to have. The Frederick White Prize, no relation of mine. Uh, I think, I think that was worth a thousand dollars. The Thomas Barron Award was certainly only worth a thousand dollars. Stingy bugger. The Collagen Surface Chemistry Award was five thousand dollars. Huh? Now that, of course, pales into comparison. Um, my good friend David Solomon got the Australia Science Prize the other day. That's half a million bucks. Now that now we're talking, you know. <coughs> All right. So they're, they're what I claim are the key performance indicators. There might be others. There might be some different ones uh, in your discipline that aren't, uh, that aren't listed here. Uh, if you're in an experimental discipline, then maybe uh, patents. Um, you notice up there that there's nothing in the way of um, uh, research funding. That's a one that's considered to be, um, to be important. I don't list it up there because I don't particularly care about it. And if I never got funded, um, it wouldn't stop me publishing. Okay, <clears throat> let me make a couple of points about about um, these p performance indicators. Um, let's, there's my journal publications per year uh, from, well you can't get it to plot past 1974, but I was, there are some of mine in here. Um, <clears throat> and that's up to 2011, so this year isn't complete yet, and this will be up here somewhere, hopefully. Um, the first thing you can see from that graph is, well, you can see where my average is drawn across that entire time. Um, I don't put out a lot, 3.5 papers a year. Um, one thing about, this is Web of Science, um, one thing you'll see here is that when you run a Web of Science citation index search, do it more than once. Right? I did publish papers in 2010, but they're not there, right? Now, I've tracked them down, and, uh, uh, but you should always run that thing at least once. The thing is not infallible, and it will miss your papers, especially if they're not in journals that, uh, that the search engine likes to look at. This is your productivity over a lifetime, right? It's a, actually a very interesting sociological um, uh, document. It's a bit like tree rings. You know how you get one of those big giant sequoias uh, and the park ranger says that ring there was when Columbus discovered America and this was the explosion at Krakatoa and, and all that sort of stuff? Well, you can do that with, with your publication um, index data as well. That was when I was awarded my PhD. I then went on a postdoc, and you can see that publications plummeted. I was having a good time in England, drinking lots of brown ale. And, but gradually I built up and up and up again. And then I got the chair in Melbourne. Nothing is more <coughs> designed to ruin your productivity than being given a chair. Um, well, one more thing I'll show you in a minute. but. Um, I spent, I spent um, uh, two years fighting with the engineering faculty about the teaching of engineering mathematics, so that's why this is all over the place. But gradually, you settle down um, and productivity rises again. Um, there's the other factor that contributes to, um, to a lack of productivity. It's not as, um, it's more transient than uh, you might think at the time, uh, but there it is. Um, there's my chair again, okay. There's a theorem in here somewhere. Never get promoted, no? Okay. Um, so again, you know, it takes a bit of time for me to learn the system, but I start to get better and better at it again. Um, 
What's that big peak there? Three of my graduate students graduated in one year and at, at CMU they all had to have a publication or they couldn't graduate. Um, so my guys worked really hard in that last year uh, and I published 11 papers. I've never done it again, but I've never graduated three PhD students in one year either again. So um, having PhD students um, increases your publication record, okay? Take home message. Um, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> <clears throat> so as I say, tree rings have nothing on this. And those of you who've got a long history might like to plot this out and have, have a look at what happened to these key points in your life. What do you learn from that? Well, seriously, what it tells me to tell the administrators, right, is not to take this business um, to heart. 3.5 a year. Where's your 3.5 this year? Huh? I'm sorry, I haven't got 3.5 this year. I promise you next year I'll have 10.7, you know. Um, publications per year means nothing. You've got to look at some sort of um, time series of publications to see any trends or anything. I can't see any trends in that. Um, look at my average and look at, look at the wild fluctuations about it. Huh? I would not use that as a KPI, right? That is that if you're trying to understand whether you've had a good year or not, right? Then how many papers you published in that year is not a statistically significant measure of it, right? How many papers you publish over five years is a statistically significant measure, but not year by year. That's my citation rate. Uh, it's not as interesting sociologically, but it does have some interesting features in it. Um, again, it only goes back to 1974. Um, but, but now, and I'm going to be interested in plotting this in my retirement. You know, I'm going to get up every year and press a button and have a look what's happened up this end. Right? Does it go down again? Right? Or do people keep citing you? Right? I don't know, right? and it'd be interesting to see what, what happens up that way. How long is your paper um, considered to be useful for? Ultimately what happens is that your paper gets cited in a big review, right? and from then on people cite the review and not your paper. Right? Uh, and so if you wanted to argue with your bosses you should argue that um, the moment you appear in one of these reviews, you should be allowed to count the number of review sites as well as, uh, uh, as, well as yours. Again, it, it's, it's much less statistically fluctuating. It's an accumulating thing. So, but this is sites per year, okay? Um, and you can see that it rises. There's a sort of a, some sort of, well, it'd be nice to say exponential. I don't know what that is exponential growth and then you see the, the turnover into this mellow twilight time, right? Um, that's, what is that? It's about 400 sites a year which is pretty good, right? I'm credentialising myself again. What do you know about a graph like that or what can you tell about a graph like that? Here's something I think is important. That year I published my most cited paper that's how many sites it was still getting um, last year, okay? It was still getting 60 sites a year. Most people are happy if their total was 60. That one paper is getting 60. What's the take home message from that? Well, I claim this one is a, is a really important one. Sites for a paper published a year ago or a, or a couple of years ago are meaningless, right? You have to wait 10 years to see whether your paper has had any, any effect, okay, as measured by who cites it after that. It takes a long time for uh, papers to be cited. Um, that may change from, from discipline to discipline, but there's mine, 
um, it takes a long time for, uh, for these papers down here to start registering a lot. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is, we're going to do a second era exercise, right? And we're going to list the papers published between 2005 and 2010. And they're going to go to Scopus, which is a crap search engine for mathematics, right? Um, they're going to go to, uh, they're going to go to Scopus and dig out your citations. And on the base of that, they're going to tell you how well you're performing, right? What's your impact? You tell me what the citation rate for a paper published two years ago, the statistical fluctuations on that are huge. You, <clears throat> you know, my impact on the literature is 60 out of 400 based on that paper there. Right? And if you're going to measure impact, you should be measuring it um, based on a history, not the last five years of publications. That's my... Um, <clears throat> The only rude things you'll hear me say in public about the ARC. Okay, so summary. <clears throat> Where am I now? I now reckon I know a, a little bit about, about a lot of research areas uh, of interest to industry and I've got the tools to tackle them. I hope I've given you this feeling that I've always felt that the honours graduate isn't well trained to do a PhD. They don't know enough um, and in fact the amount they don't know is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? I don't want to go into why that's so, but it is so, and if you deny that, I think um, uh, you've got your head in the sand. This is certainly in science. I don't know about other discipline areas. Um, we have dumbed down our undergraduate curriculum. That's basically the, the reason. <coughs> I've always despised the classic PhD. Um, uh, it's, it's, it was invented to train for an academic career. It doesn't have anything to do with being useful to the rest of the world. Um, and it's one of my favourite phrases is that um, you know, your classical PhD is you work harder and harder discovering more and more about less and less until you know everything about nothing. Right? Uh, it, it, that's, that's the way, it, that's the, how it's worked. It's been designed to be like that. Um, if you want to do that, fine, but, you know, I want to know everything, right? And I want my students to want to know everything. The last point there takes some realising and it is still not accepted by academia, and that is that industry has important and challenging problems that would make great PhD theses. But academia shies away from, oh, it can't be as important as solving Fermat's last theorem, you know, who said, you know, um, other academics have told me that you will never get a good thesis out of an industrial PhD. Now that is patent nonsense, right? And I'm pretty sure that applies in your <coughs> area as well as mine. Okay, so that's where I am. Let me quickly go through what a doctoral training centre is. This is a, <clears throat> an industry doctoral training centre. There are two sorts in England. There are industry DTCs and there are DTCs. The industry DTCs are engineering, science-based ones that have a strong industry connection. And then there are these more academic ones uh, that, that um, have some industry connection but are mainly more like a centre of excellence than a, than, uh, than a, you know, and they're, they're basically, they exist because there's a, a group of people at that point in time that are excellent and they've formed one of these things. So, the first doctoral training centre in Australia is an industry doctoral training centre. It is in maths and stats. This was picked because it was felt that it spanned the waterfront, that you could, you could find a maths and stats problem in most industries in Australia, and I believe that's true. Um, it's a multi-node um, uh, concept here. There are multi-node ones in England, but I don't think there's as many, that, I don't think there are any that have five nodes, but anyhow, we have five. You're one of them, okay? As I said, it's based on the UK 
um, IDTCs, but it's got some it's got some differences. One, we're we're trying to build a larger industry interaction than um, than the English ones. There is industry interaction in England. They're very important components, um, but ours is 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 even bigger than that, as you'll see. Um, the funding for the scholarships in this program comes from uh, comes from industry itself, uh, not the government. Now that's totally the opposite in England. The, uh, uh, when you form one of these doctoral training centres, you get a gong from the government and they immediately put their money where their mouth is. They give you a large amount of money to pay for scholarships and they're your scholarships that you give out. Right? They're not the university scholarships that your guys compete for, they're yours right? as the director of the doctoral training centre. Um, I was told that last year when they did the budget crunch in England, no university scholarships were given out. The only scholarship money that was given out were for doctoral training centre scholarships. Now when you think about that, that's, that's the end of universities as we know it. I'm not, I'm not um, sure that that's a happy uh, arrangement, but uh, because I'm proud of the fact that universities um, permit people to study motherhood in ancient Rome as well as um, how to integrate uh, one on X. You know? I mean, there's, there's um, universities are about the universe. We should study everything there. And to suddenly find that unless you're in one of these centres of excellence, there are no scholarships um, is a little frightening. But I think it's the future, um, whether it's frightening or not. Uh, the government will put their scholarship money into these places that they have decreed uh, these centres of excellence. It hasn't happened in Australia yet, but I think it will. Um, okay, so what is the program? Very simply, it's a four-year PhD, not a three-year one, a four-year PhD. There's the funding for the scholarship is there for four years. And the reason for that is there's compulsory coursework that we reckon is about a year's worth over the, over the period. <coughs> no question the final product is the standard thesis. There's no diminution of what that is, right? You still have to get judged by external assessors and all that sort of stuff. It's still the same amount of work. Um, the other aspect of this that is important, and it's important I think if you go this way as well, is that there's a, a, a cohort experience that you can build up here. You can have, you can have a team building um, thing here because you've got this set of people that are going to be together for a lo uh, you know, four years and you can set up this networking, that business schools, um, you know, be, what do they call them, MBAs, um, spend a lot of time networking their people, you know. Um, and you, it, it doesn't just have to happen there, it can happen in in uh, maths and stats, in, in industry as well as, that. so that you can be a graduate of this program and you know people that are placed in other companies around and you've got a problem, you can, um, you can uh, go to them uh, and ask them how they would solve something. Um, the research project, uh, and this is where it's heavier here than it is in England, the industry emphasis, the research topic has to be generated by industry. It's not an academic topic that you talk some industry into expressing interest in like you do in a linkage grant, for instance. This is a project that industry wants solved as part of its uh, business. There are academic supervisors and they can come from anywhere across the ATN University, so you, it doesn't have to be um, the nearest node to the industry, although it would generally tend to be that way. Neither does it have to be someone from the uh, maths and stats school. If the best statistician to do a particular job is in the business school, there's no reason why that person isn't a supervisor in this, in this program. I have no preciousness about uh, where the supervision for these, for these things uh, lies. There's an industrial supervisor. Someone at the <coughs> company um, is involved in the supervision of that student. And, and can monitor their progress and can explain to the bosses in that company 
why they're spending the money and where, where the student is at that particular point in time. <coughs> this one is vitally important. When an industry signs on in this scheme, uh, they sign a contract in which the university states that the IP that is generated belongs to the company. Off the top, no, no question about it. It just says, you're paying for it, you've come up with the, with the research project, anything that comes out of this is yours. Right? And so you don't have the years of argy-bargy that you get between your lawyers and their lawyers about um, where the IP is going to reside. The universities have all agreed that they just waive IP for these scholarships, and that's going to speed up things enormously. Here's another one that we're a bit precious about in universities. We think the students should spend a lot of time in the university. Well, they should. Um, they should spend some time there. They should get to know their colleagues locally. <laughs> but remember, these people have a, a, a collegiality that is multi-university. Um, uh, and so um, we can now uh, then, um, uh, we can take students who are working in the company already and without telling them they have to give up their work in order to come to the university, they can, um, uh, they can uh, remain at their job. It's simply a matter of the company defining their job to be this particular piece of research. Okay? So they will spend a lot of their time in the company, let's say two-thirds of their time in the company. The coursework in the program um, is designed to produce, I think, a better quality uh, graduate, one that knows more about how the world works, as well as knowing more about the basic skills that didn't get taught um, in the honours program. So we have an induction course that will take place at RMIT in, uh, f in January, February uh, uh, 2012, that's our first cohort, where we do a week where we look at research methodology and we look at research ethics. And then we go on from that week to, to go into the maths and industry study group. Uh, and uh, I won't explain what that is because I've probably well and truly gone over my time. Um, they're going to learn professional skills um, that's already online, so that's easy to, to run. There's an online module system in the ATN LEAP program that goes through the e-grad school, and um, we're, we're making compulsory four of those modules, those three, um, and then you can pick one of those as, as the fourth uh, module. They're done under your own, in your own time um, uh, online. And then there's the advanced technical skills that are going to make up for the fact um, that you haven't been well trained as an honour student or because we've taken you from some other discipline, science, engineering, economics, um, and we have to bring you up to scratch in some mathematical technique. So there'll, there'll need to be what I call zero to infinity courses that will take you from knowing nothing to, to a pretty high standard of knowledge over, let's say, 25 lectures. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Um, Students can be either full-time students uh, with a variety of backgrounds. They have to be math rich, but, but still a variety of backgrounds. We're not precious about where that happens. Um, and those students will cost 40000 a year. The other mode is to have an employee of the company uh, enrolled as a student in this scheme, in which case the company um, is already paying their wage, so you don't have to pay that. But there's a maintenance fee of $10,000 attached. So that $40,000 is a $30,000 student stipend for four years and there's a $10,000 a year maintenance fee. That maintenance fee is necessary because we ship these students all over the place. They're all shipped to Melbourne for this induction course. In the middle of the year there's going to be a, a student conference. They all get shipped to that. They will be shipped to one or two conferences um, every year. So there's, that maintenance fee is important. These are, these are more expensive students because of that. Um, that's our business plan. We're taking in 25 students a year uh, up to steady state at 2015. We will have 100 students enrolled. Um, that is uh, 20 per node and that's uh, a pretty large amount of students. Um, we will probably have to increase the maintenance fee over that time 
um, because our funding from um, the government uh, dies out over that period. Um, uh, and, uh, but if we had 100 students uh, and we had uh, 12,500 a year uh, coming in, we would be well and truly self-sustaining uh, in 2015. So that's it. Um, thank you for your attention. I'm sure I went well over time. I'm sorry.